Osmani. Now, this is going to be a warship you won't have heard of before, but it's a warship you should be interested in because, well, she's Turkish. And she's built because, well, the Emperor, Adul Aziz, felt that, frankly, the Ottoman Empire was in trouble. He tried to do a lot of naval construction. He, His passion for the Ottoman Navy led it to being the third largest fleet in the world after the British and French navies in 1875. And he was incredibly interested in strengthening the Ottoman Empire. He manages to stay on the throne for 15, nearly, well, nearly 15 years. It's 25th June 1861 to the 30th of May 1876. And when he gets finally deposed, it's because there's been crop failures and various people would like to replace him with someone who's going to be less spending money on the Navy and less keen on making sure the money is spent where it's supposed to be spent. He received a thorough Ottoman education, but was an ardent admirer of material progress. Um, he travelled extensively to Western Europe, including Paris, London, and Vienna in the summer of 1867. That's six years into his reign. He also was a keen historian and composed some classical music. When he's deposed in 1876, the grounds are mismanagement of the Ottoman economy. Now, the trouble is he's trying to maintain government spending on things like navies, etc., which are long-term infrastructure projects. Whilst at the same time, there are crops. And one interesting thing about the, the, the scenario that comes in from this is that you find pick are the same ones he was going to do himself. That justification for getting rid of someone who was interfering a lot and was actually making ministers start to do what they're supposed to do. Now, he died six days after the overthrow. But his ships frankly lived on, but in a very interesting state. Shameless book plug. Always going to be in there. I'm very proud of it. Mainly because it's my first one. So, why have I got Turkish ships in here? Because they're reconstructed. The amount of effort the Turkish put into reconstructing these ships, they turn them from being one thing into another thing. They turn them from being capable of theoretically higher speeds for short terms, using a older system, to being a quite high speed, long range capable vessel, in that it can maintain that speed. They completely redesign it from, I would argue, from an ironclad to... Well, it's one of those interesting things. You have many generations of ironclads. This is almost a second or third generation ironclad, and it's upgraded to something which is almost equivalent to a sixth or seventh generation ironclad. Because the pace of technology moves at that greater speed. They're really very interesting ships, and really very capable ships. But the Osmani herself is the lead ship of a group of four ironclads. 
built in the 1860s. They were the first of their type to be built for the Ottoman Empire. All four are built in Britain. Osmani, um, Azizi, Azizi, and Orani are built by Robert Napier and Sons on the Clyde. And Mahumadi is built on the Thames Ironworks. Well, by the Thames Ironworks. They were broadside ironclads as they were originally built, carrying mm, 14, 8 inch, and 10, 36 pounder guns in a bank of guns on each broadside. So the thing about it is, you're going to have 7 of the 8 inch and 5 of the 36 pounders each side. They have one thing which goes through their entire career. They are at 6,400 metric tons, considered too large, too important, too prestigious to lose. So they spend most of their life being held back, being held in reserve, or being sent as far away from action as they possibly can. Even after they've been rebuilt into barbette ships, like this. That's what they look like as built. Six boilers supplied a single compound engine to achieve a theoretical top speed of 13.5 knots. They were often also carrying a 9-inch RML Armstrong gun that could be shifted around to provide fire forward or sort of along those axes. It's a capable weapon, it's a capable system, but they have a wrought iron armoured belt. Which is not the greatest thing in the world, but for its time was pretty good. You can see the ports forward for the 9 inch gun to fire out. But they go from this to being rebuilt by the Imperial Arsenal. That's something cool. They are actually rebuilt in the place which had built some of the largest ships of the line. Again, we forget about this with the Turkish Navy. At several points in history, they have been one of the Ottoman Navy, been one of the largest navies in the world, and the modern Turkish Navy tends to be not much of a slouch either. They have issues. They have all sorts of infrastructure issues to this day. But you get rulers come along and governments come along who really do understand they need a naval strength because... The Ottoman Empire often is considered a crossroads. There's all these different routes running across their territory. And massive land borders, so they have to be a land power. But they also have a lot of maritime routes running through their territory. So they can't afford to not be a sea power either. That's actually the crux they, the cross they have to bear, um, literally and figuratively. Because that means they're always faced with a lot of expense. And the army will always say, well, we need funding. Yeah, but if you don't have a navy to support you, then how are you going to do half the operations you need to do in the Black Sea, etc.? Because logistically, the navy will tend to be your maneuver asset, which will allow your forces to be supported and maneuvered. It's one of the interesting things. You'll often, in, in many nations which are faced with this particular problem of having large land borders, if they have only a small sea, 
access to the sea, and they have built a manner, then they will tend to focus on internal infrastructure. But if they are a spread out empire, which geographically is spread out and has a lot of sea, which is internal, i.e. like the uh, eastern Mediterranean is to the Ottoman Empire, the Gulf, uh, the Black Sea, etc., all these things, that tends to become a very critical maneuver asset. And then you have problems because quite often it will be taken as a given that they will be able to maneuver across the sea. Because you look out across the sea, it looks open. It looks free. Of course we'll be able to move when we want to move. It's a problem. Now, you can't always be viably moving around. You can't, you, you won't always have access to the sea unless you get access to the sea, unless you almost ensure access to the sea. And for that, you need a navy, and for that, you need to invest. And leaving ships light up in reserve, etc., for long periods of time actually makes it harder to activate them. Because you need to have crew who are knowledgeable of them, and you need to have crew who are semi knowledgeable to actually activate them. It's you need to have the dockyard facilities to quickly activate ships. It's one of the interesting points that comes out is one of the the British uh, embassies, naval attaché, is sort of uh, thinks that at their dockyards at one point, the Ottomans would be lucky to get five ironclads into service within six months because the dockyard has run down that much, and they are that short of crew. Not just the reservist crew, but also the colonel crew, the regulars who keep the ship running and provide that core of the crew that are then expanded on by the reservists. So it's not, it's not an easy thing to activate ships. You need to keep the ship numbers, but you also need to sort of maintain the reserves and the capability of it, and the dockyard capability to activate those ships. And it's, it, again, it's something which is often forgotten in current discussions. You know, we, we talk about ships, we talk about the reserve vessels. How much discussion is made into the infrastructure available to activate those ships if they've been reserve, in reserve? Because they're probably going to have to visit a dry dock before they go out to sea, before you take them off operations. Or sensibly they should do. To be checked over and maybe have some work done. Hopefully it won't be much work, but they'll probably need something done. So she's rebuilt in the arsenal, and they have six coal-fired marine, Scotch marine boilers put in, and two triple expansion engines, which allowed her to reach the new speed of 10 knots. Yeah. But allowed her to maintain that 10 knots for a lot longer time. Armament, two Krupp 9.4-inch of 240mm guns installed in individual barbettes, fore and aft. And broadside weapons are still included. They get six 105mm Krupp guns installed in upper deck Swansons. And eight 150mm Krupp guns in broadside mounted the sort of fire out. They've got a little bit of range of motion of firing, but not great. Uh, two 47mm quick firing Hotchkiss guns were retained from their 1884 refit, where they gained four of them. And the Nordenfeldt guns will actually goes up to five from two. They'd already had two from earlier. So, you know, that's not bad. It's not massively brilliant, but it's not bad. And then the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 to 1878 comes. This is one of those interesting things because... Abdulaziz had actually managed to, to an extent, keep a lid on this. He managed to build enough friendships in West and everywhere else that he made it diplomatically difficult for people to for there to be such a war. And he managed to keep relationships with the Russians going well enough to buy himself time and economic time. And it's no surprise that the one he's replaced with. Well, yeah. 
let's put it this way, he is... Uh, he, Abdulaziz is replaced by Murad V, who only lasts 93 days before it's replaced, it replaced in favour of his own half-brother, because he's quite so nuts. We'll leave that to one side. It basically, the Abdulaziz going doesn't lead to a good time for the Ottoman Empire. And the Russo Turkish War, when it does break out, well, the Ottomans have to hold back their ships. The argument is often made they're held back because, you know, they're the largest, most powerful vessels of the fleet, and the high command decided they ought to be preserved. But the reality is, crewing them and actually getting them ready for combat and sending them is pretty difficult. And what happens if you lose them? This is what happens when you have a high command which doesn't understand you buy ships to use them. Rather than talk about them. What is also interesting is Aziz had, again if we talk about Abdul Aziz, he had coupled building this navy with doing things like going and personally meeting Queen Victoria. There is a wonderful painting you can, if you want to go look it up, of him meeting Queen Victoria aboard the yacht, the royal yacht, Victoria and Albert. And it's during 1867. He established personal relationships with a lot of the rulers in Western Europe. And he used his navy, his aim had been to use his navy as well to go around and continue visits and build up those relationships more. He'd had consistent difficulties at home doing this. But his whole plan had been to use the navy to cement and protect Ottoman, the Ottoman position by tying it into the rest of the world. By making the rest of the world think, well, we need the Ottoman Empire to be there because if it's not there, we're in, we're in trouble. We can't afford... The Ottoman Empire is a good and valuable friend. We like the Ottoman Empire being there. We'll do other things or we'll support the Ottoman Empire. It fell apart after he went. The people who came after him weren't up to that class. Please note, I'm not saying he was an ama amazing or a great guy or anything like that. I'm just saying he was a good sultan. The Ottoman Empire did get a few very good ones. And it got many good ones. The trouble is... It ended up getting a run of bad ones who were mostly chosen by the courtiers and uh, the powerful elite because they wouldn't get in their way and were easy to control. And that's not necessarily the thing you want in a leadership. It might be good for you short term. Long term it's going to cause a lot more problems. Long term, it's better to have someone who's um, capable in charge. You might think of them as just being a figurehead, but the moment you turn the person at the top into a figurehead, at some point, someone's going to think about turning the person in your position into a figurehead so they can really rule. And that's when you get start to get problems, because you get not only the sultan being a figurehead, you get the prime ministers and the senior ministers being figureheads selected by their departments because, you know, they won't cause trouble in terms of the, inside the department. It spreads down. So what we've got coming up? Um, well, we've got, should by this point have the patron vote definitely going, so we'll know what 76 and 77 will be, and we've also got the Chilean Civil War and the sinking of the Blanco Entlada on 23rd of April. That'll be fun. And the Battle of Hakadote in the 4th of May. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming up. And next week we have... Mahan. Justifying a Navy to a Continent. Alfred Fair Mahan. Oh, that reminds me. I should take that book away with me. I will do. I will. I will take Mahan away with me. So I can read it again and again while I'm away. Thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed.